Okay, let me. Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, in this session, we are going to complete LDA and QDA, and then we are going to uh, go over SVM, kernel SVM, and if there is time to other classifiers and these things. And I think this will be a very exciting and interesting session. I myself love SVM, especially the theory behind SVM, which is completely solid and sound in mathematics. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very interesting, I can say. Okay, so any question before we start? No? Okay, let's review what we had in LDA and uh, Q QDA uh, in the last session very briefly, and then we'll continue where, from where we stopped. So we said optimization for boundary, decision boundary, we said we have some data set and we want to classify them, assume we have two classes, so it's a binary classification problem. And we know that uh, we, we are gonna talk about LDA and QDA. In LDA, the decision boundary is linear, in QDA it's quadratic. And both, both of these classifiers uh, partition the space of data uh, to, to the classes, okay? And LDA stands for linear discriminant analysis, QDA quadratic discriminant analysis. So we started with saying that, okay, let's consider the PDF or probability density functions uh, of the uh, two uh, classes. And uh, also we, we know that the PDFs are the derivatives of the CDFs, cumulative distribution functions. And then we said, okay, let's, consider the decision boundary to be where the probabilities are equal to each other uh, in uh, for belonging to each of the classes, okay? And then we uh, form the probability of error as in equation four. So the probability of error means that we misclassify, the probability that we misclassify a data point and let's minimize that. Then it, it became an optimization problem. So we simplify this probability of error as explained before. And then we came up with equation 11 that we then we had an unconstrained optimization problem. So let's take derivative, set it to zero. And we did that and we end up, ended up with equation 12. Also, we said uh, we can find this decision boundary uh, in another way by equating their posterior probabilities. And then we en ended up with equation 15, which is uh, the equation 12 again. Then we said, okay, now assume that the probability distribution function, so, so until this point, we didn't have any, did, we didn't make any assumption on the distribution of classes. Now, from now, in from this slide, we said, okay, let's assume that the, uh, the, this, the classes have Gaussian distribution. Why? Because this is the most common uh, distribution in continuous variables, okay? And then, uh, okay, we said, so let's put the PDF of Gaussian distribution in the uh, equation that we found by minimizing the probability of error. Then we, uh, this, we, for uh, now, we, we, are, we are gonna talk about LDA. In LDA, we make another assumption too, an additional assumption saying that let's assume the covariances of the two classes be equal. And let's denote them the co covariances by sigma. Uh, and when we do that, some terms are simplified and cancel each other. Then we will end up uh, by simplification that we discussed last session, we will end up uh, with equation uh, 20, which is a, an equation of a line. So it means that the decision boundary uh, for the LDA is just a line. Hence the name linear discriminant analysis. And uh, we said that, okay, if we uh, denote the uh, equation of the decision boundary by delta x, then by the uh, sine of delta x, we can be, uh, decide uh, which side of the line we are, hence which class uh, the point belongs to. And also we said that if the priors are equal, then it becomes more simplified to equation to equation 23. 
Then we talked about quadratic discriminant analysis, which says, I don't make the additional assumption anymore. I only assume that the distribution of two classes are a Gaussian, but I don't assume that they're, uh, that their uh, covariances are the same. So I didn't uh, make this assumption, then it, would, uh, it became quadratic discriminant analysis. So I have sigma one and sigma two now, they are not necessarily equal to each other. If they are by chance equal, QDA reduces to LDA. The quadratic decision boundary becomes linear. Interesting, right? Okay, then uh, we worked it out and simplified and these things, and then we ended up with equation 25, which is the equation of a quadratic function, okay? And uh, that, hence the name quadratic discriminant analysis or QDA. And it partitions the space like what we have drawn here. And if we denote the decision boundary by delta x, by the sign of the delta x, we can find out which side of this quadratic function we are, therefore, which class we belong to. And if the priors are equal, then again, it becomes more simplified to equation 27. So I think it was here that we stopped. OK, let's continue. So, so far, we talked about LDA and QDA for binary classification. Now let's uh, generalize it to multi-class classification. So now we consider multiple classes, uh, which can be more than two, indexed by K from, goes from one to uh, the cardinality of C. Uh, cardinality of C is it, here means the number of classes, okay? Uh, I denote the number of classes by this. Recall equations 12 or 15, doesn't matter. We, what was that? Do you remember? It was the equation which we found by minimizing the probability of error, okay? By, or by equa equating the posteriors of the class. Uh, then here, the, so we had this and this in the equation 12 or 15. We had the probability or uh, the PDF times the prior, okay? The, the, this was the probability of, if I remember correctly, just give me a second. I want to make sure I'm not wrong. Uh, equation. Just give me a sec. Okay. This was, yes. So this is probability of X belonging to the CK. No, no, this, this is probability of X belonging to CK, the prior of the class CK. And what was the FKX? I believe it was, um, yes, it was probability of X given, yeah, I think it was this. Probability of x equals x given that x belongs to the CK. This is actually what the numerator of the base group, okay? Uh, that we found out. And uh, what is this? This is exactly, we can write it in this way. So I'm uh, replacing fk of x by this. What does it mean? It means that uh, the probability that x belongs to the uh, class ck, okay? So, or kth class. So we, we use the mean of the kth class. We also use the covariance of the kth class. Is it clear what I'm doing? Okay, so this is the probability that x belongs to the kth class. This is the Gaussian distribution for the case class, right? And this is a, a prior of the case class. Okay, now let's take a natural logarithm from this and uh, recall that this, we have it in equation 12 and 15. If you don't believe me, let me go back for you to recall these equations because these are important. <laughs> equation 12 and 15, which we just saw. Let me bring it.
So this was 12. F1, P1, it was F2, P2, right? Or 15. We had F1, P1, or it was F2, P2. In two ways, we found it. Either by minimizing the probability of error or by equating the posteriors, okay? We, in two ways, we found that. And now, so here we had F1, P1, Pi1, F1, Pi2. Now we have FK, Pi K because we have multiple classes, okay? So that's what I'm talking about. And now, so we have um, several classes. So let's denote the index of the class by K. Then we will have FK Pi K. So this is FK Pi K. Now I wanna simplify it. So I take natural logarithm Y because I want to make the multiplications, convert them to summations. Also, I want to get rid of the exponential operator, okay? Uh, so this is in the denominator, so this part, right? If you take natural logarithm from this, uh, these twos, these twos here are because of the square root, right? And these minuses are because this uh, is... Uh, in the denominator, is the square root is in the denominator. And uh, the rest I think is obvious. And this D also, this D is because of this power D. Okay, now the, the exponential part also goes away and the multiplication here becomes plus. Or uh, here, the mi this minus is because of this minus, okay? And uh, also, at the end, we have a multiplication here becomes plus and natural logarithm of pi k. So I think it's obvious. Okay, now let's drop the constant term minus d over 2 uh, log of uh, 2 pi. Why? It's constant. It's constant, and we don't care about it for derivative. Okay, it's constant where, with respect to our uh, optimization variable. And uh, which is the same for all classes. It's the same for all classes. Does it care which class it is? So this term minus two, two uh, d over two, then a natural logarithm of two pi. Does it care? Uh, does it depend on k? No. So uh, therefore we can drop it. And this term is multiplied before taking the logarithm. Yes, okay. Thus the scale posterior of the k class becomes this. This is exactly what we found. And why do I call it a scaled? Because I ignored that constant term. Uh, so this is what we have. And we can this, uh, take it as a decision boundary, delta, for the uh, case class, OK? Now, for deciding whether a point uh, is in which class, we can take, we can say which of the classes maximizes this equation 28. Why? Why am I doing this? What's the philosophy behind this maximization? Can you tell? Guys, notice here that fkx pi k is the posterior. Is the post what was the posterior? Do you remember? Let me go back again to equation 15 and take a careful look at how we found equation 15. You should understand the philosophy behind that. Question 15. How did we end it up with this? By equating, in equation 13, by equating the posteriors, right? Right? Correct? And uh, when we equated the posteriors, uh, meaning that even at a data x, the probability that it belongs to the uh, class C1, equates let's set it equal to given that uh, given the data x is probability that it belongs to the class two and then we, uh, we equ uh, equated them to each other the denominators canceled each other and the numerators were f1 pi 1 equals f2 pi 2 okay and what did i in that slide calculate fk pi k so if you put the denominator back it becomes the posterior of the case class, okay? That's why I also called scaled posterior because ignoring the, ignoring the denominator, 
F k pi k is the scaled posterior uh, of the case class. What is the posterior of the case class? It's F k pi k over this summation. So scale of it is F k pi k. Now, when I say argument max, which class max which uh, which class maximizes F k x pi k? It means that for a given point x. I want to calculate, I want to see which class maximizes the posterior. And what is the posterior? Probability of belonging to that class. That's why I'm taking maximization, because I want to know which class has the maximum posterior for that point. Given the point X, this is the probability of belonging to class K, right? If K X pi K pi K is equal equal to p x belonging to c k given x with some scale which i ignore right with some constant scale therefore i maximize that in other words f k x pi k which we found in that slide which we calculated is p of x belonging to c k given x given the data x times some constant which is this which i ignored the denominator. I ignore it because it's constant for all of the classes. So when I say maximize this, I'm saying that which class is max has maximum uh, more probability for that point. Okay, I think now it's obvious, right? Okay, so that is the reason in multiple classes, I take max, arc max, arc we, uh, when I say arc max means which of the classes, which k maximizes this delta kx for a given x, right? This x might be a training data point or test data point, doesn't matter, okay? This equation 29 is a test phase of LDA and QDA. Okay, because it maximizes the posterior of that class. In this expression, delta k, uh, kx is equation 28, which we have, okay? And this is QDA. Why? Did we make any assumption that the, the covariances of the classes are the same in this slide? No. That's why it's QDA. Okay. Now let's have LDA for multiple classes. Okay. This was QDA for multiple classes. In LDA, we make an additional assumption. Now we have several classes. So set them all equal to sigma that all of them be equal, okay? Therefore, equation 28, which was this, I'm repeating equation 28, which we had in the previous slide. Where, where was that? It's exactly what we had for QDA. Now we can simplify it. It, uh, it becomes this. How? Let's see. So I'm replacing sigma k with sigma. Also here, sigma k inverse with sigma inverse. Right? And then what happens? What happens? So I'm, I write this as X transpose minus mu K transpose. Then I sim uh, multiply the terms of this to each other. I will simplify it into these three terms. So this term is repeated here. This last term is repeated here. This term is broken into these three. Okay, now again, we drop this. Why can I drop this? It doesn't depend on K. Why couldn't I drop this for QDA? It actually depended on K. We had Sigma K in QDA. However, in LDA, all of them are Sigma. So it doesn't depend on K anymore. So I can drop it in LDA. It becomes more simplified than K QDA. So which are the same for all classes, therefore it can be dropped. And then it becomes more simplified to this equation. And this is actually, let's see, this equation 31 is the equation of a line. Let's go back for QDA and take a look at equation 28. This is actually uh, quadratic with respect to X. Do you agree? This term is quadratic. 
That's why question 28 is a quadratic function decision boundary in QDA. Equation 31 is equation of a line linear decision boundary in LDA. Okay. Uh, so, yes. And then we again for LDA, we take arc max of delta kx, where delta kx is equation 31. Okay. Now, do you agree by this? I can partition the space. What do I mean by partitioning? I mean, I have some space, assume in this 3D space, assume D is three, okay? Therefore my X is three, 3D. My mu's are 3D, the means of the classes. My sigma, my covariances are three by three matrices, right? So it's, and I have some, a bunch of data points here, okay? Assume, uh, you people in this side of the class are class one, and you people in this side of class are class two. Okay, when I apply uh, LDA, what happens? It exactly uh, draws a lot, but line in 3D becomes a plane. So a plane passing through this 3D space, okay, passing this three, uh, through this 3D space and separating the uh, two sides. And now when a point comes here, a test point, uh, the LDA says, this is in class one. When a point comes here, it's, LDA says, because it's the other side of the plane, it's class two. Now you, you can see the whole 3D class became partitioned into two classes, okay? We can have three classes, you one class, you one class, me one class, and whoever is near me one class. So we'll have what? Three, so one, you consider the, there can be a decision boundary between you two, a decision boundary, linear decision boundary between me and you, a, a linear decision boundary between me and you. So three planes will have, and they will uh, touch each other at some point. So you can see, consider th three walls. So one of them is coming here until here, and this becomes two walls, okay? So three walls separated the whole 3D space, okay? Now, when we have QDA applied on three classes, for now, two classes, U and U, two classes, I apply QDA in this 3D space. I will have a curvy wall, a curvy plane, you can see, a curvy quadratic function, right? By the way, this will not be a curvy wall like this. It will be like an egg. How can I draw it? A curvy egg, uh, this, do you get my point? The end of egg, consider the end of egg, make it big, a wall like an end of egg, just quadratic in 3D, right? So it separates the two classes. Now, assume we have three classes in this space, we will have three eggs touching each other at some point. So one big egg comes here, one, egg skin, I mean. One big egg skin comes here. Until here, another egg skin comes here. Another egg skin comes here. So I'll have three quadratic functions for separating the three classes. And how did I, how can I find these decision boundaries? You will see, you can either draw the decision boundaries delta x's, or you can have a grid mesh or mesh grid, sorry. Mesh grid on this space, okay? In order to partition the space. You can have a mesh grid. What do I mean by mesh grid? Consider every point with some small steps in the whole 3D space, okay? And calculate the arc max of delta for each of the points. And you will determine, estimate their classes. If you color the estimated classes by some color, for example, I, uh, I have three classes. I have this point, then a point next to it, a point next to it, a point next to it. I will take arc max of delta x for uh, delta k for all of them. This gives me, this says, uh, this point says that this is class one, I make it green. Class one make green. I come here next to me, close to me, suddenly it becomes class three. I color it by red, for example. And then when I come toward you, suddenly at some point, when I pass the decision boundary, it becomes class two. I color it maybe with blue. 
then uh, you will see that the whole 3D space became three with three colors. Some part became uh, red, some uh, green, some part became red, some combined part became blue. Did you get it? This is partitioning the space. Okay. Some classifiers do that, such as LDA, QDA, such as K-nearest neighbors, which we'll see. Okay. Okay. Now, Estimation of parameters in LDA and QD. So do you remember we had mean in all of the decision boundary equations such as this, such as this? We have mu and sigma. We have mu one, mu two until mu c, all of the classes, sigma one, sigma two until sigma c, but if it is LDA, we we'll only have one sigma. Okay. At least we have some parameters. How do you find this? to put them in the equation of the decision boundaries. How do we find them? In LDA, so we have means and covariance matrices and the priors, priors also, pi's. Do you remember? Pi one, pi two, until pi. So these are the parameters. Okay, the priors of the classes are very tricky to calculate. It is somewhat a chicken and egg problem, why? Because we want to know the class probabilities or priors to estimate the classes because we want, you, we want to use them in delta. However, we do not have the priors and should estimate them. So we need to estimate uh, the pies, but for estimating the pies, we need pies. So it's a chicken and egg problem, but we can make this trick. We usually, the prior of the case class is estimated using the sample size of the case class. Okay. So you can say, assume where we have three classes. One of the classes have, has five points. One of the classes have four points. One class has one point. Okay. Of course, the more points for the classes you have, the better estimation you will have. Okay. So the fewer, the less accurate it will be. But even assume that this is the population of classes. So class one, five points, class two, Four points, class three, one point. Then in total, we, will, we are 10 points, right? So class, the prior of class one will be five over 10, half. The prior of class two will be four over 10. And prior, uh, the prior of class three will be one over 10. Our summation becomes one, right? Because the, the prior should sum to one, right? Okay, so you can estimate it in this way or for simplicity, if you know, that uh, maybe uh, by some uh, prior information, you know that you can set the priors to be equal. Do you remember we said that we can assume they are equal and it becomes more simplified, okay? So that's one thing. The then mean of the class can be estimated by sample mean of the class. This is indicator function, meaning that the, the point xk belongs to the class k, okay? So C of XK means the label of the uh, estimated label of XK and K is actually XI and K is the, uh, uh, the label of that class, the K class. So we want by indicate by this indicator function, we'll see whether XI is in the class K or not. And then what does this do? It sums all of the points in the K class, right? Sums all of the points in the K class. Uh, Note that, note that we are using these XIs are the training data points. So we know their target labels. We know their target. This is a classification problem. We have a train phase and a test phase. Test phase was R max of delta, right? Training phase, in training phase, we can calculate the means and uh, covariances because we already have the target labels. Okay. So, uh, by sample mean, it's called sample mean. Also, it can be proved that it's maximum likelihood estimation or method of moments for the Gaussian distribution. Simply can be pro uh, proved. You can see this is just an average. Okay. Also, we can, for covariance, we can use this, which is a sample uh, covariance matrix. And it can be proved that this is the the maximum likelihood estimation of covariance in Gaussian distribution, okay? So what is it? It says that xi minus mu times xi minus mu transpose. This becomes a matrix, why? Because this is a column vector, this is a row vector. 
So this becomes a matrix and only for the points in that inside the group. So we can use that for all uh, the classes, or if you want it to be unbiased estimation, recall the preliminaries. Rather than nk in the denominator, we'll have nk minus one, okay? And this will be an unbiased estimation of the covariance matrix. And in LDA, so in QDA, we use equation 34 or 35 for the classes. In LDA, we also uh, have several classes. So we have, uh, we calculate the covariance matrices using equation 34 or 35, but we need to add, make them equal to each other, right? In LDA, this was the assumption of LDA. Therefore, we can take an average of all of them, an average of all of them and use that as sigma, okay? An average as done in equation 36. And by the way, it will it is a weighted average where the, the weights are the cardinality of the classes, right? Weighted average. Is it clear? Okay, weighted average. Here, can you see this figure? Very interesting. So this is output of my own code. You can find this code in my GitHub. This is a link. Uh, I coded that and you can see it's in Python. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, and what does it do? I did exactly what I told you. For, for coloring the partition, for partition, I made a grid, mesh grid. I estimated every point but with some small step and I, I colored them by the estimated, uh, by the estimated uh, classes, class labels. And just, you can see it partitioned very well. And you can see in LDA, so these are three in the first row we have the results of LDA. In the second row, we have the results of QDA. For example, in LDA, here, this is a decision boundary, which is linear between the two classes, okay? And here, when we have three classes, it's like three walls, three uh, linear walls. They can be hyperplanes in multiple dimensions, which touch each other, right? And uh, here, in the right-hand side, you can see that when we have multimodal classes, so in this class, we have one mode, one mode here. So it's like two Gaussians, right? LDA doesn't perform much well. It works up to some level, but it doesn't work, uh, perform well. Why? Recall the theory of LDA, which we proved. We considered a Gaussian distribution for the class a Gaussian distribution for the class. Did we consider two Gaussians, a mixture of two Gaussians for the class? We assumed that every class is unimodal, only unimodal Gaussian distribution. Do you remember? So in several cases, LDA, might, LDA and QDA might fail. One case is that the classes might not be unimodal. We, we actually made an assumption that they're unimodal. And we also made an assumption that they're unimodal Gaussian, right? So QDA may fail if it's not unimodal, it's just multimodal, or if it's not Gaussian, it might, be, might have some other distribution. LDA might fail in three cases. So LDA failed in these two cases. LDA fails if it's not unimodal, if it's not Gaussian, and if it's their coherences differ a lot because we made the assumption that the coherences are the same. Okay, here, hi. So here in a uh, second row, this is QDA. This is actually quadratic. And when we have three classes, the, these are the decision boundaries. Three quadratic functions touching each other. And again, this is QDA, which for uni, uh, multimodal, it works a bit better than LDA because it, it has less, amount of assumption, not number of assumptions. But at least, again, we, uh, in both LDA and QDA, we assume that they're unimodal. Okay, LDA and QDA are metric learning. Okay, so what do I mean? L let me talk about it. So recall equation 28, which was a scale posterior for the QDA. This was a delta K X for the multi-class multi, uh, classification of uh, QDA. 
first assume that the covariance matrices are all equal as we have in LDA, okay? And assume they are identity matrix. So they are equal and they are identity matrix, which means that all classes are assumed to be spherically distributed in the uh, D-dimensional space. So they are like hyperspheres, right? Uh, in all dimensions, their variance is the same. After this assumption, the equation 28 becomes this. Why? Because put identity, uh, identity inverse is identity. So it becomes this. And also the log of one is, what is log of one? Is zero, right? So log of identity becomes zero. This goes away. So it becomes simplified to this. Okay. Uh, and if we assume that the priors are all equal, the term, uh, this term is constant. If we assume that the priors are equal, sorry. If we assume that the priors are equal, then this goes away and it can be dropped. So it becomes only this. Now let me define this, the L2 norm between L L2 norm of X minus mu K it means that the Euclidean distance between X and the mean of the kth class by DK, okay? Then uh, this equation 39 becomes minus half DK squared, okay? Thus, QDA and LDA reduce to simple Euclidean distance from the means of classes. If the covariance matrices are all identity matrix and priors are equal, we just proved that. So if we assume that the covariance matrices are all identity matrix and the priors are equal, we'll end up with equation 39 for the decision boundary of QDA and LDA also. Because LDA is just has more assumptions applied on equation 39. So for both LDA and QDA, this analysis is okay. And this becomes just uh, Euclid square to Euclidean distance. Simple distance from the mean of the classes is one of the simplest classification methods used in uh, uh, where the used metric is Euclidean distance. What does it mean? I think if someone doesn't know anything about machine learning, okay, you have a bunch of, you have several classes. Okay, you have several classes. I give you a test point. I say, what is its class? The simplest thing which comes to your mind, even if you don't know any machine learning, what is that? Yeah, but we have uh, several, you are right, but you have, we have several points in each class, okay? So someone here said that the nearest point, but we have several points in each class. We need to have a representative for every class. So we take average, the mean of the classes. So this, the nearest or the closest mean from this uh, point determines the uh, class of that point, right? And exactly by these assumptions, LDA and QDA reduce to the, this algorithm, this simple algorithm, saying that, okay, let me calculate the distance to the means of the classes, right? Now consider the case where, uh, where still the covariance matrices are all identity matrix, but the priors are not equal. Okay, then we have this, right? Do you remember? We just proved that in the previous slide. Okay, equation 38. If we take exponential or inverse of logarithm from this expression, what happens? The pi k becomes a scalar factor or a weight. Okay, let's take exponential from this. What does it do? We'll have exp of minus half x minus mu k transpose x minus mu k times times pi k. Do you remember, do you agree? When you take exponential from this, it becomes this, right? Times pi k. Then this pi k becomes a scale factor or a weight. Now let's analyze that. This means that we are still using distance metric which is this, this, is the, this was a distance metric we talked about, right? The distance metric to measure the distance of an instance from the means of the classes as done here, 
but there is a but here, but we are scaling the distances by the priors of the classes as done here. We are scaling them, okay? If a class happens more, that is its prior is larger, it, might, it must have a larger posterior. So we reduce the distance from the mean of the, its class. Let me explain. I have this weight here. Now let's analyze what is this weight doing. When I have several classes, one of the classes has larger prior. What does, mean, what does it mean? It means that it is more probable to happen. Okay. Then it means that I, uh, so as it is more probable to happen, it is more probable for the test data to belong to that class. So I will reduce, uh, uh, so I will reduce the distance from the mean of this class. In other words, consider this, when pi one and pi two are equal, this assume this is a uh, mu one, assume we have a cloud of data points here and we have a cloud of data points here. Too. Okay. Then the decision boundary is like this. But now assume pi two is more than pi one. Pi, uh, so class two is more probable to happen. Then it means that it's like pushing the decision boundary toward here. Why? Because pi one times this becomes a smaller, but pi two times this becomes bigger. So it gives bigger region. If pi one is greater than pi two, it means that its prior is larger. So I'm pushing the decision boundary toward that, toward uh, this mu two. Therefore, I have more region for class one. So it's exactly playing around with decision boundary in the space is doing it's called this uh, distance metric. So uh, it's, it's like doing, uh, it's playing around with the distance metric. It's called metric learning. We'll, we'll dig more into the metric learning later in the class, okay? But just for you to understand that LD and QD are metric learning. And metric here means this distance metric, okay? L, uh, okay, as a next step, consider a more general case because we assume that covariance matrices are equal to identity. Now, let covariance matrices are not equal as we have in QDA, in general case. Let's apply singular value decomposition recall preliminaries, SVD, to the covariance matrix of the kth class. Okay? Uh, this mu, uh, if you apply SVD, or EVD, eigenvalue decomposition or a single value decomposition. If you apply, eigen, if you see it as eigenvalue decomposition, U delta, U becomes eigenvectors, delta becomes eigenvalues. But if you see it as a singular value decomposition, you will have U sigma V transpose, but V transpose becomes U transpose, why? Because sigma is uh, symmetric. Okay, because it's symmetric. So doesn't matter whether you consider it as SVD or EVD, okay? Uh, and then what happens? Sigma inverse becomes this. Okay, because uh, inverse changes the order of multiplications. And also we know that uh, sigma inverse, U inverse is equal to U transpose because U is uh, orthogonal matrix. Therefore, we can simplify the following term. So let's simplify this that we had in a uh, previous slide, okay? If we do that, use, so replace sigma inverse with what we have here. Then bring this inside this and bring this also inside this parenthesis, okay? So you take the left U and bring it to the left parenthesis, right U transpose to the left. So I think for the right one, it's easy. So we'll have U transpose X minus U transpose mu. However, here we have a transpose. Here we have a transpose, therefore we need to change the order. Okay, so if we have like x, uh, x, it will be x u transpose, but it shouldn't be here. It should come here because of change of order. Therefore, you you will have u transpose x and u transpose mu. Right? And what is this? What is this? So we had this. What is this? Can you tell me? This is a diagonal matrix with non-negative elements, okay? This in the middle. 
because it has uh, eigenvalues or singular values, okay? And we know that covariance matrix is for, uh, positive semi-definite. So it's not negative. Therefore, I do agree that I can write it in this way. Can I write a positive number as it's square root times it's a square root? For example, three, I can write it as this, whatever. As long as it is positive. If, if it's negative, we can't do that. But we know that as sigma is positive semi-definite, uh, it's safe to do that. Therefore, I can write this, decompose it into these. Then again, apply what I told you. Bring this here, bring this inside the parentheses. Again, using the same technique, we'll have this, this changes the order because of the transpose, but here it's easy in the right-hand side. And then we we'll also have noticed that this is diagonal, so uh, this transpose is the same as itself. And now let's define this operator, which maps x to delta k in, uh, to the minus half, uk transpose x. So applies this transformation on x. And where do we see that? We see this a lot in here, here and here and here and here. We see it four times. Okay. So. So if I have considered these, this becomes what? Exactly here. This becomes here. So I'm changing this. I just proved in the previous slide that it's ex equivalent to this. Do you remember? We, we simplified this to be this. Phi is the transformation which I defined in the previous slide. And I'm putting that back in delta uh, k of x, which was equation 28. And I came up, end up with equation 42. What is it saying? Hi, guys, listen. What is it? Ignore for now, ignore these two terms. Let's talk about this middle term. Ignoring that, we can see that the transformation, which is was phi, the transformation, formation has changed the covariance matrix of the class of the uh, to identity matrix because here you can see it's i inverse right so it has this after applying this transformation the covariance matrix has become identity therefore qda and also lda can be seen as simple com uh, comparison of distances from the means of classes after applying the transformation to the data of every class so it seems I have some data points. I, I apply some transformation on them. And how do I calculate this transformation using the covariance matrix of classes? After this app, uh, applying this transformation, suddenly I see that all of the classes has become like uh, spherical in the space. Okay, now it's fair to use Euclidean distance from the means. At initial, it's not fair. Because one class is big, one class is a small, it's not fair to compare simply to their means. I apply some transformation, they become very simple. And then I apply, uh, I take the distance from the means. This transformation to become uh, spherical is also called whitening in signal processing and machine learning, okay? It's also closely related to PCA, principal component analysis. So we are doing some kind of whitening, okay? Uh, whitening, I mean this. Okay, in, in other words, we are learning the metric using the SVD of the covariance matrix of every class, okay? Thus, LD and QD can be seen as metric learning in a perspective, interesting. Now, note that in metric learning, a valid distance metric is this. This is a valid distance metric if A is positive semi-definite. Let me briefly talk about it because it's important. Uh, consider this class. I think I have it somewhere else in my slides, but for now. Consider these two classes, and this is a test point. 
The means of these classes are these. So this is one mean, this is one mean. Okay, by Euclidean distance from the means of the classes, so it's, it's class one, this is class two. I take Euclidean distance from the means of the classes. Euclidean distance tells me that this test point belongs to class one, but human eye says it's in class two. Human eye understands that it's not fair using Euclidean distance. That's why I said after this transformation, then they become spherically, and then, then it would be fair to use uh, Euclidean distance. This was the main idea behind metric learning and machine learning. Metric learning says that Euclidean distance is not necessarily fair. Let's learn the best distance metric, okay? For our own task. Last century, last century, there was a scientist named Mahalanobis, okay? Indian scientist in England said that he was a statistician at the same time as Ramanujan. These two are very great Indian mathematicians. Ramanujan was in number theory and Mahalanobis was in statistics. They met in England, okay? Mahalanobis said, had this idea. They said, it's, he said, it's not fair. So he proposed this as a distance metric called Mahalanobis distance metric rather than Euclidean distance metrics. Says X minus mu, the transpose X minus mu in the middle, I use sigma inverse of the classes. Why? You tell me, when I have a huge sigma variance here, I should reduce the distance. So I shouldn't use sigma. I should use sigma inverse. It has an inverse relation. When variance is big, I should give importance more to it. So I should reduce its distance. So I will have sigma inverse, right? It's distance from the mean. Did you get the idea of Mahalanobis? Now, some people came after Mahalanobis said, let's generalize it, call it generalized Mahalanobis distance metric. So I replace sigma inverse with A, but A needs to be positive semi-definite. Why? For, for satisfying convexity and triangle inequality in distance metric. Do you remember one, one of the properties of norm also closely related to distance metric was triangle inequality, recall preliminaries. For that too, it can be proved that A needs to be positive semi-definite. Then this became generalized Mahalanobis. And the whole field in machine learning is distance metric learning. Let's learn the optimization parameter is A. Let's find the best A in the distance metric for our own task. It can be classification, embedding, whatever. Okay? And as you see, LDA and QDA are kind of metric learning. Okay. Acknowledgement. Uh, for more information on LDA and QDA, refer to our tutorial paper, Linear and Quadratic Discriminant Analysis Tutorial. And code of my LDA and QDA, my code is in this GitHub page. And uh, for more information on LDA and QDA, see the book by Tip Shirani, uh, uh, Friedman, uh, and Hasty, uh, The Elements of a Statistical Learning for LDA and QDA, they, they, they talk about it. Some slides of this slide deck are inspired by the teachings of Professor Ali Qutsi and Professor Muju at the University of Waterloo Department of Statistics, and also Professor Hoda Mohammad Zadeh at Sharif University of Technology Department of Electrical Engineering. Okay, references. The, this is the book, Elements of Statistical Learning by Hesitip Shurai and Friedman at Stanford. Uh, this is a, a survey on distance metric learning. Uh, this is another survey on metric learning. This is a tutor, our tutorial paper on linear and quadratic discriminant analysis. We also have, I forgot to mention it here. I also have a, a, another tutorial on this on uh, metric learning. It's called Spectral, Probabilistic, and uh, Deep Metric Learning Tutorial and Survey. It's on archive. So uh, you can take this so Spectral, 
probabilistic and deep. These are the three categories of metric learning. Metric learning, just search this and you will, it will come up. Search this with the keyword Gojok or Benjamin Gojok, my name, and it will comes up. Uh, I think that's also a good tutorial to take a look at for metric learning. Okay. And now let's move to the next topic. LDN QD is over. By the way, before uh, I finish LDN QD, let me tell you one thing. First off, I only said that we have some other algorithm with the same short name in machine learning, and that's latent uh, Trishlet, I think, uh, analysis. Am I right? A latent Trishlet analysis. The short, it's short is LDA. You shouldn't confuse these two algorithms. Also, there is an algorithm which we will see later in this course in Fisher discriminant analysis. That Fisher discriminant analysis is also called Fisher's linear discriminant analysis. So we can, sh it's short can be FDA, FLDA. Sometimes people use the word LDA for that algorithm. So sometimes when people in the literature, it's a bit confusing. When they say LDA, they are not referring to this algorithm. They are referring to Fisher discriminant analysis. Why? Because we will see in, later in this course that FDA, Fisher discriminant analysis, is equivalent to linear discriminant analysis. But how? Let me tell, tell you one thing. LDA is a classifier algorithm. FDA, Fisher discriminant analysis, is not a classifier. It's a dimensional reduction algorithm. Okay? But how are these two equivalent when one of them is classif for classification, one of them is for dimensionality reduction or feature extraction? I'll tell you how. If we will see that. If you apply feature discriminant analysis to extract features, and then in that feature space of FDA, you use Euclidean distances from the means of the classes, it's like you apply LDA on the input space. So if you apply, if you apply LDA for classification in the input space of data, it is equivalent to extracting the features of data by feature discriminant analysis. And in that feature space, you use Euclidean distances from the means of the classes for the sake of classification. These two are equivalent. Okay, that's why sometimes they are used interchangeably in the literature. That was one important thing. Okay, now let's talk about uh, SVM. One of my very interesting topics, which I really like, support vector machines. Okay, how much theory of SVM do you know? I want you know to I want to have an estimation of how much do you know about SVM? What? Basic. Yeah, because it has, you will see that it has a lot of in depth theory. And when at the end of this session, you will say, I didn't know anything about this. I just had heard, had heard of it. Okay. This is actually SVM. And there are much more about it. And I will say that I can't cover the whole thing, but we'll cover the most important parts of SVM. It's a big topic. Here's SVM versus Perceptron. Okay. Perceptron is a, a neuron of the neural network, and I have covered that in deep learning course. It's not related to statistical machine learning, but it's good to compare it with SVM. So Perceptron is just one neuron of neural network for the sake of classification. Okay. Perceptron was proposed by Rosenblatt, which was a psychologist in 1958 at Cornell University. Cornell uh, Aeronautical Laboratory was a neuron of the neural network for binary classification. Okay. We co covered in deep learning course. In later attempts, Hebian learning proposed in 1949 was used for learning in Perceptron. Okay. We know that. Perceptron cannot generalize well enough because for linearly separable classes, it finds one of many possible decision boundaries. What do I mean? Consider these two classes. 
uh, each of each of these uh, lines that I'm drawing, they can classify these two classes. Okay, but when assume I take one of them and it's here. Now a test point comes, maybe this. This is a test point. This is supposed to be in the second class, but by error, this decision boundary is saying that it's in the first class. Why? Because it's too close uh, to, to one of the classes, so it misclassifies a lot of them. Okay. As you see, it's too close to this class that even the parts which are here, it cl classes, classifies them as a cross class rather than the circle class. So it's not generalizing well. By chance, it might find one of the good ones. I think that one of the good ones is this, which has largest distance from the two class, right? But, but one of the bad ones might be this. This is a very bad one, but perceptron might find it. So based on its initial random initial uh, initialization, it can find one of them. Okay. Then some people said uh, Vapnik et al. Vladimir Vapnik, and I think you know that Russians have a very are very strong in mathematics. Very strong. Okay. Uh, I don't know what they are studying in, in their schools. Apparently, very strong mathematics they are studying. Okay. Uh, Vapnik was very strong in mathematics, and we'll see that he even adopted the idea of kernels from functional analysis of mathematics, one of the hardest uh, fields in mathematics, which, which was also used, the idea of kernels, which was also used in uh, quantum physics. Okay, so it's serious mathematics behind these algorithms. Uh, Vladimir Vapnik changed the whole of AI. The, the world of AI. So in 1974, he said, let's find the best decision boundary by optimization. Okay, let's find the best one. And what is the best one? He thought a lot with, with his group. And finally, they came up with a good justification of what is the best decision boundary? What is the best one? He said, okay, let's find the closest points to each other to the to, to the other class they are most probable or capable of being confused right because this point for example is very far away from the other class it's less probable to be confused let's focus on the points which are very close to each other to the other class to the other class so this point is very close to the other class this point is also very close to the other class he and his group called them support vectors. Support, hence the name support vector machine. They just named it support vectors. Maybe because it's, these are vectors, these data points are vectors, and they are supporting their algorithm. Maybe I don't. Know. Okay, but I think this word support is because of is related to the normal vector and support vector of the decision boundary. I think that's a, a bit related. But anyway, they called them these support vectors, okay? Now, let's say they said, let's optimize the decision boundary, the location of decision boundary by these support vectors. And let the decision boundary be exactly in the middle. For this to, uh, to visualize, assume these are two groups of kids, okay? They want to fight with each other. They come to the streets, Two groups of kids, they say, let's fight. Which one is the stronger? They, they have a wall, they bring some wall between them. Assume that there is a wall, they are playing a game. They are playing a game, okay? They push the wall, so they, they are making a game. They push the wall. They have two representatives. One of the groups has this representative, the other one has this, okay? They say, okay, I'm stronger. The other one says, I'm stronger. They, they push the wall. At the start, at, at the start of the game, this is one of them, this is the other one. Maybe the wall is like this. They push it, they push it. So these are the two hands of these people. They push it, they push it. Maybe it sometimes it becomes like this. Sometimes it becomes like this. Sometimes it becomes like this, depending on who becomes tired. 
assume they are both equally strong or both equally weak. Okay. Then what happens if they're equally weak or equally strong? The wall would stagnate exactly in the middle. Okay. With the same distance from the two people. This is exactly the idea of a sphere. You can see it as a fight between the two classes. Okay, so the distance here and this should be equal. Okay, and that's the best decision boundary for, for generalization. Why? Because when a point comes here, a test point, it, it is more probable to be in this class rather than this class. Why? Because it has less distance from the circle class. When a point comes here, it is more probable to be in the cross class because it has less distance from the cross class. That's why exactly in the middle is the best decision boundary. Okay. So now we understood the idea behind SVM in the year 1974. Now let's see how to make it mathematical, model it mathematically. We want to find a linear decision boundary, linear decision boundary for binary classification, where one class falls in one, on, in one side and the other class falls in, on the other side, okay? The equation of a line for linear decision boundary is this. Beta transpose x plus beta zero equals zero, okay? Where x is d-dimensional, the data point, beta is also d-dimensional normal vector of the linear line. And beta zero is the bias or intercept or DC signal, whatever you call it, of the line. So you can see it in this figure. Here, this is a decision, a line, linear decision boundary, okay? This is the normal vector because it's normal on the line, orthogonal on the line. This beta zero is a scalar, so beta is a vector, but beta zero is a scalar it's showing the intercept, right? If we don't have beta zero, it will be a linear function. Now, as we have intercept, it is an affine function. Okay. Okay. Consider any two points, any two points, x1 and x2 on the decision boundary, like this, like what we have here, x1 and x2. As the line passes through each of them, they bo both should satisfy equation one, which is the equation of the de decision boundary. So we have this and we have this, right? Then as they are both equal to zero, they're equal to each other too, okay? So now I rearrange this. These two beta zeros cancel each other. I, uh, I rearrange. Uh, the expression, it becomes this. What does it mean? This means beta, the vector beta is orthogonal or perpendicular on the uh, vector x1 minus x2. And what is that? This is the vector connecting x2 to x1. Okay. That's also a proof of why beta is a normal vector for the decision boundary. Okay. Now consider a point x0 on the decision boundary. x0 on the decision boundary. And the point x on, this, on one of the sides of the decision boundary. One of the sides, there is a point x. So x0 is on the decision boundary. x is one of the points on one of the sides of the decision boundary, okay? Then what happens? This is x minus x0, the vector connecting x0 to x. That this is the normal vector beta, this length of projection of x onto the vector beta is, is equal to beta transpose x minus x zero, but normalized by the length of beta. Okay? Okay. So, uh, by the way, as x zero is on the line, it should satisfy the equation of decision, decision boundary, linear equation. So beta transpose x zero plus beta zero equals zero. Okay, let's rearrange that. It gives us beta, beta zero, okay? Now the distance of point x from the decision boundary, as I told you, is beta transpose x minus x zero, but beta, but normalized by the length of beta, okay? If beta is already normalized, the length, the 
L2 norm of beta becomes one. Then, so I can bring it to the numerator. So I'll have beta transpose x minus x zero over L2 norm of beta. I can apply it on, in the parentheses. So I'll have beta transpose x minus beta transpose x zero over the length uh, L2 norm of beta. I use equation two here. So rather than minus beta transpose x zero, I use plus beta zero. Okay, so so far clear. This is the distance, distance of point x from the decision boundary, this length, right? I denote it by d, distance. The distance should be non-negative, right? Because this equation three become maybe negative and the distance should be non-negative. Therefore, I need to use absolute values. L2 norm is a non-negative quantity. It can come out non-negative scalar. It can come out by the properties of norm. So I will have absolute value only in the numerator. Okay. However, the absolute value is not as smooth and not differentiable, especially at zero at origin. Therefore, we can multiply. Let's use another trick to get rid of the absolute value. We want to make it smooth because we want to take derivative in optimization. It will be a pain in the neck. So we use this technique, which we also use the same technique in perceptron and the other algorithms which we talked about in deep learning. But the same idea is here. When y is plus one, which means that the point is in the class one, I'm at top of the decision boundary, right? This is a decision boundary. So assume this is a decision boundary. This is class plus one. This is class minus one, okay? And this is the beta, normal vector beta. You tell me. When I am in class one, which is which I'm here, my y is plus one, and I'm on the uh, on upper side of the decision boundary. Therefore, beta transpose x plus beta zero is greater than zero. Right? When our y is minus one, I'm the uh, on the other side. I'm below the decision boundary. Therefore, beta transpose x plus beta zero is less than zero. Less than zero. Do you agree? that if I multiply y by beta transpose x plus beta zero, it's always non-negative. Do you agree? So I can replace this absolute value of beta transpose x plus beta zero by y beta transpose x plus beta zero. Now you understand the philosophy of why we are using plus one and minus one as the labels rather than plus one and zero. Rather than zero and one, we use minus one and one as the class labels. Using this technique, it became a smooth. Okay? So this is a good technique in machine learning. This is D that we found, the distance, okay? Now, do you agree that if X is on, right? If X is on the decision boundary, this distance is zero, do you agree? I'm on the decision boundary. What is the distance of my point from the decision boundary? Zero. When I'm not on the decision boundary, this distance is positive. Distance of the point from the decision boundary. Okay. Suppose there are n points, n data points, and their class labels yi. So we have d dimensional data points, n of them, and there are labels and labels, each of which the labels are scale, but the data points are d-dimensional. Okay. Do not uh, do, do not confuse this d as a dimensionality of x with the d of distance. Okay. Don't, don't confuse. Then also the labels are either minus one or one. Okay, for n or for all of the points. The closest points to the decision boundary are more at risk of being confused and misclassified. 
Therefore, in each class of data, these closest points to the decision boundary are called support vectors, okay? We want to maximize the margin or gap between the support vectors and the decision boundary. So between the support vectors and the decision boundary, we want to maximize that. If we had one class, that would push the distance to infinite. However, we can't do that because the other class is also pushing. So the if, and we are assuming they are both equally weak, therefore it will be exactly in the middle. So the decision boundary becomes as far as possible from the data for having least amount of misclassification, right? Okay. Now that is the reason I'm maximizing the distance and distance di. So I have n distances, do you agree? Uh, how many distances do I have? I have n points. So I have n distances of points from the decision boundary. By the way, for now, I'm considering all of the points. But at the end, you will see that optimization is formed in a way that it only considers the support vectors. So starting now, when I'm optimizing, I'm formulating it, I'm considering all of the points all of the endpoints. But at the end, we will see that it only considers the support vectors automatically. Okay, let's see how. By the way, uh, all of you guys are looking somewhere else. Are you, are you listening to me? So, see, I'm maximizing this distance and this distance will prove that it's here, is this, right? And the optimization variables are beta and beta zero. These are the optimization variables, right? Because beta and beta zero determine the equation of the decision boundary. Okay, this can be converted to a minimization problem. How? I just use its reciprocal, okay? Minimize the, re the reciprocal of this, okay? Reciprocal. Uh, and for all of the points. Okay. Now I had it, I repeat it here. Assume we desire to find a decision boundary. Assume we desire to find a decision boundary which has some distance from data of classes so that the distance of points are positive for support vectors. Let the constant S denote the smallest distance of to the decision boundary, okay? So do, do you agree that well, I have a bunch of distances of the points, okay? One of the points is closest. Or if I have two classes, assume my decision boundary is in the middle exactly. So two of the points, one point from one of the classes, one point from the other classes, have the smallest distance from this decision boundary. And this distance is the same because it will be in the middle. So, so there is a lower bound on the distances. Let it, let's call them S, this term. Okay, which is, and we'll see that this is a distance of support vectors from the decision boundary by our definition, okay? Then all distances are greater than or equal to this S. Right? Okay. All the eyes. As this expression. You miss. Sorry about that. Forgot to put it in charge. <clears throat> Give me a second. Okay, guys, guys, as this expression is greater than or equal to the constant S, so we can assume that its numerator is greater than or, or equal to some constant. Do you agree? When I say this, can I say that yi beta transpose xi plus beta zero is greater than or equal to S times second or uh, L2 normal? Beta, I'm just multiplying this de denominator, bring it here, right? Then I 
denotes, I say this uh, as C. I denote it by C. Right? So far clear. Okay, now this equation appears in the denominator of equation eight. Where was this was equation eight? This is exactly what we have. Right? The denominator. Okay. We can convert the optimization problem eight, which was this, I have repeated it here, to minimization of its numerator while its denominator satisfies equation nine. Do you agree? Okay, so I'm minimizing a fraction. I just proved that the, the denominator should be greater than or equal to C. So let me minimize the numerator and use this as a constraint for the uh, denominator. Okay, so I'm minimizing bet, say L2 norm of beta, but the constraint, but the denominator, which we had it here, should satisfy equation nine, and I put it as a constraint. Okay, and it should satisfy it for all of the endpoints. Clear? Okay. It is similar to minimize this rather, uh, rather than, it is simpler to, uh, to have one over two. I just multiply one over two for the, uh, uh, so do you remember what were, we, what were we minimizing? L2 norm, right? L2 norm of beta. Is L2 norm of beta convex? Can you answer me that? Is L2 norm of beta convex? It is not. A squared L2 norm is convex. A squared L2 norm is quadratic. A squared L2 norm of beta is equal to beta transpose beta, which is like a bowl. Therefore, and I know the, the larger the L2 norm of beta, the larger the squared L2 norm of beta. Therefore, I replace L2 norm of beta by a squared L2 norm of beta, but I also multiply half. Why? Because I, because I know that derivative of a squared L2 norm of beta is two beta, beta and I want the two in the, the derivative be canceled by half. Okay? So I have this. Now, the constant C here can be any constant, which is not important because, because of not having effect in the derivative, because the con derivative of constant is zero, right? Therefore, in the literature, sometimes they usually use C, the one as C. So you, they usually say in the constraint, they say yi times beta transpose xi plus beta zero is greater than or equal to one. Doesn't matter, it's a constant, okay? Now the constraint, Let's talk about the constraint. Guys, are you listening? So now let's talk about the constraint. Here, this is the constraint. Do you agree that I can multiply the side? No, no, I can bring this to the right-hand side. So it becomes this. I brought the le left-hand side to the right-hand side. So minus y i times better transpose x i plus better zero plus c is less than or than or equal to zero. Okay, that's correct. Now, why do I do that? Why did I do that? Because if you see my optimization course in, on YouTube, you will see that we usually, when we have minimization, uh, it's easier to work with less than or equal to constraints, okay? Therefore, as I have greater than or equal to constraints here, I convert them to less than or equal to constraints, less than or equal to zero, okay? Now, for more information, see the optimization course. So what I'm saying, the Lagrangian is this. What are the parameters of Lagrangian? So these are the optimization variables, beta and beta zero. I introduce N Lagrange multipliers, also called dual variables, okay? Lagrange multipliers or dual variables. Why? Because I have N constraints. I have n constraints, not, it is not one constraint. You should be careful for all i from one to n. So I have n constraints for each of which I need a dual variable or Lagrange multiplier. And I call them alpha i, okay? So, uh, so this is a constraint less than or equal to zero and times the Lagrange multiplier, sum them. 
This is exactly Lagrangian. We briefly had it in the preliminaries, but for more information, see the optimization course, okay? Now, what happens? This is the Lagrangian. We take derivative with respect to the, uh, the optimization variables, okay? The optimization variables are beta and beta zero. Take the first take derivative with respect to beta. What happens? This is derivative is two beta. These two, these two twos cancel each other. We have beta. This, what is it? You tell me. Inside the summation, I have minus alpha i, y i, beta transpose x i, uh, my, minus alpha i, y i beta zero, plus alpha i c inside the parentheses. I just multiplied this alpha to the terms. Okay, I also considered this minus here and all of them. Okay, so this is now, Let's take derivative with respect to uh, beta. By the way, derivative is linear operator, passes through the summation. So I have summation here. Uh, and then this, the derivative of this with respect to beta is min minus alpha i, y i, x i. Note that alpha i is a scalar, y i is a scalar, x i is vector. Then I bring this minus behind the summation. Okay, set it to zero. The other terms are constant with respect to beta. Set it to zero, rearrange, beta becomes this. This is one of the formulas in SVM. We just proved that. Okay, equation 12. Beta. Beta is summation of alpha i, y i, x i. i goes from one to n. Alpha i are the dual variables we will find out what alpha i is. Y i are the target labels, uh, scalar, which are plus one or minus one. X i are the d-dimensional vectors, okay? Training vector. And now let's take the derivative with respect to beta zero. What is it? The first term, which is this, is constant with respect to beta zero, goes away. Uh, inside this, this, the first term in summation, is constant with respect to beta zero, goes away. The second term in summation is derivative is minus alpha i, y i inside the summation. And I bring this minus to the behind the summation. And the third term is constant again with respect to beta zero. Set it to zero. So this minus, we don't care anymore. We'll have this summation of alpha i, y i, for i goes from one to n equals zero. Okay. Let's substitute this, these two that we found in the Lagrangian. If you want, this is not mandatory to uh, see my optimization course, but for, for interested uh, students and audiences. If you see my uh, optimization course on YouTube, the session about KKT conditions and Lagrangian, we had the method of Lagrange multipliers, okay? That in that method, we talked about it we take the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to uh, primal optimization variables. So beta and beta zero are the primal optimization variables. Alpha i's are the dual optimization variables, okay? We say, we take the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to primal variables. We find some expressions, then we put them back in the Lagrangian. This is exactly what we are doing. We are putting back beta and beta zero that we found in the Lagrangian, we are using the method of Lagrange multipliers, okay? So the first term, I wanna substitute equation 12 and 13 in Lagrangian, but it is big, so I need to do it term by term, okay? The first term, which is this, let's talk about it. The first term can be simplified as half, beta transpose beta. I replace beta with this and also that this is beta transpose, this is beta. But alpha, uh, alpha, by the way, for the first beta, I use J notation, J index. For the second beta, I use I index. Why? Why don't I use I for both of them? Because I don't want the indices to be confused, okay? So I use J and I 
and we know alpha j, y j are scalars. Transpose doesn't do anything on them. And x j is a vector because of this transpose. It becomes x j transpose. This the second term will have alpha i y i x i. We found this in the previous slide. Okay. Now, do you agree? I can uh, bring this summation here. So I will have the summations next to each other. And these are scalars. So in the multiplication, we, we can bring them back and forth. Then we'll have xi transpose xj. Why? Because xj transpose equals xi x. So here I will have xj transpose xi, but it is equal to xi transpose xj. There's inner product of a, a transpose b equals b transpose a. Okay, I can change the order in inner, inner product because the result of inner product is a scalar. Okay, so I am writing xi transpose xj. Okay, now the second term, the second term, which was this. Let's substitute beta and beta zero in the second term, which is a bit hard. Let's do it. What happens? First, let's simplify this second term. So I multiply alpha i in the terms and I will have summation. So I will have this term, this term, and this term, these three terms, okay? I simplified them. Now, do you agree that alpha i and y i are scalars? So I don't, I can bring them back and forth in multiplication. Therefore, I can bring beta transpose here. Also, I can bring beta transpose behind the summation. So that's correct, okay? I will have this, okay. What else? Again, alpha i, y, i are scalars. I, beta zero is also a scalar. I can bring it behind the summation. C is a scalar constant. I can bring it behind the summation. Clear? Okay, now what do we do? Now we substitute. So far, we, uh, we just simplify uh, the terms. Now let's substitute the found beta and beta zero in this term. So what do we have here? We have beta transpose. Beta was this. I'm using the jth index for this, but I have transpose. So I have x j transpose. Alpha j and y j are scalar. Transpose doesn't do anything on them. Here, um, so this, this is exactly what we have here. And this is minus beta transpose. And uh, by the way, this is zero, why? The second term is zero. We just proved that in equation 13. Okay, see, very interesting. This term is, sorry, this term is zero, goes away. The third term is this, I'm repeating it. So the third term is here. I can simplify this first term by bringing the scalars next to each other because in the multiplication, you can bring back and forth the scalars. Then I will have xj transpose xi, which is equal to xi transpose xj. Did you get it? So we substituted beta and beta zero in the terms of Lagrangian. Let's put them back. What is the mean for that? What? Why are you doing x, i, j, x, i, transpose, h, j? What? No, I'm just putting the beta inside here. I'm just simplifying. In the first term, you wrote the equation, right? Why are you doing the conversion? Why? Why, yeah. why am I saying that rather than x, j, transpose, x? Doesn't matter. Just, just, you can write it as x, j, transpose, x, i. Well, because usually in it's the same in the second term, right? Yes, but it doesn't matter. We can write it as x j trans. Why do I do that? Because I usually in my machine learning and these things we say i j elements rather than saying j i elements. That's it. Okay. Now we 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 simplify. We substitute it and simplified and by term by term. Let's put the terms together. Okay. So this was the second term. This was the first term which we found. We put them together in the Lagrangian. And in method of Lagrange multipliers discussed in optimization course, when we substitute 
the obtained primal variables. In the Lagrangian, it gives us some function of only dual variables. We call that dual function. Okay, again, let me repeat. You can see that session in optimization course, but I'm explaining it here too. When you uh, take derivative of Lagrangian with respect to primal variables set to zero, you will get some expressions for the primal variables. You substitute these primal variables with expressions you found in the Lagrangian. Do you agree that this Lagrangian will not have any primal variable anymore? There will be only dual variable in it. This is called dual function denoted by G. And this is only a function of dual variables. Okay? Dual function. Then now, as I said, I put them, the terms that we found next to each other. Interestingly, these two are exactly the same. Just this is half, this is minus one. Half minus one becomes minus half. Do you see how exciting it is? It became very simplified. The dual function became very simplified. Now also, guys, guys, you know, in the KKT conditions, in the optimization theory, when we have inequality constraints, less than or equal inequality constraints in the minimization, the dual variables should be non-negative. This is for proof and these things, for discussion on this, see the optimization course, okay? Therefore, here we had less than, because we converted the constraint to less than or equal to constraint and it was minimization. Therefore, it's dual variable, alpha i's for all i from, from one to n should be non-negative, should be either zero or positive, okay? This is one of the KKT conditions, K. cone tucker in optimization. SVM is closely related to KKT conditions. I know you're tired. Let me finish this hard margin SVM. We'll have break, okay? So, because there are several parts. And now let's put all of them together. So again, in optimization course, in method of Lagrange multipliers. So what did we say? We formed the Lagrangian. We took derivative of Lagrangian with respect to primal variables set to zero. We found some expressions, put them back in the Lagrangian. It gave us dual function. Now we maximize the dual function. We were minimizing the primal function, the, the initial function that we had, the cost function. But when we came up with the dual function, we do the reverse, we maximize it. Why? Because if you see in, my, in optimization, I have talked about it in the course, in the optimization course. Assume you, this is function f you are minimizing, okay? When you form the uh, dual function, dual function becomes something like this. There is, there might be a gap between f star, which is the minimum of f, and g star, which is the maximum of g. But their solutions, I mean, what X star, which minimizes F, or alpha star, which maximizes G, correspond to each other. And this gap might be zero, might be positive. If it is positive, it's called weak duality. If it is zero, it's called strong duality, okay? Again, as I X star and alpha star correspond to each other, rather than minimizing F, I can maximize G, okay? So now the, uh, this, I maximize the dual function, the dual function, but I know that the dual variables alpha i should be non-negative. We just talked about, it. okay? Also recall this we just found, we had found in equation 13, equation 13. We found this, that summation of alpha i, y i should be zero. I put that as another constraint. It should be satisfied. This is called dual optimization problem. So when we maximize 
the dual function with the constraints that the dual variables should be non-negative for the less than or equal to constraint the inequalities. This is called dual optimization problem. Okay. Now we define alpha. So we put alpha one to alpha n as a vector next to each other. Okay. But why? Because I want this, I want to write this in matrix form or vector form. Okay. To make it more simplified for you to understand. So alpha one to alpha n, the column vector, n dimensional column vector, let's call them uh, bold uh, alpha. Put y1 to yn, call it bold y, n dimensional, right? All of the labels together. Also, let one be the vector of ones, n ones, n dimensional, okay? Let matrix S consider whose ij element be this. Why? Why do I do that? Why do I take that? Because I have this here. I have it here. I have yi, yj, xi transpose xj. I, I want to write it in matrix form. Therefore, I define a, a matrix S whose ij element is yi, xi transpose, yj, xj. With, if you, yj is a scalar, you can bring it back in the multiplication. You will have yi, yj, xi transpose, xj. Okay. And then do you agree that you can write this in matrix form like this? So this is minus half. We have alpha i, alpha j. Therefore, it's quadratic with respect to alpha. Therefore, I can write it alpha transpose alpha. But in the middle, this is a pen in the next term. So I will have it S as S. Okay. Then I have C here. This is summation of elements of alpha i. Alpha. What does it mean? So rather than summation of elements of alpha, can I write it as alpha transpose the vector of ones? or one transpose the vector of alpha. Do you agree? Okay, so I can write it in this way. This is also a good technique in machine learning. These are thousands of techniques in this that you are being introduced to try to learn them. But when you want to write summation of some elements and in, in vector form, you can write it as one transpose that vector. Okay, then rather than this constraint, I can write it as y transpose alpha equals the vector of zero, okay? And rather than this, I can write that the element, this alpha, this, this notation means that all of the elements of the vector alpha are greater than or equal to zero, okay? And take a look at this. Do you agree this is a quadratic uh, function? This is a quadratic function. The cost function is quadratic with respect to alpha. The optimization variable is alpha, right? And uh, these are linear uh, constraints. If you see the, the preliminaries of optimization course, you'll see that this is an, a standard optimization problem and quadratic programming problem. Quadratic programming problem. So it is a concave optimization problem. Why? Why is it concave? It's not convex, it's facing down because it has minus half in the quadratic, minus half. So it's facing down and it makes sense. It should face, face down because I want to maximize it. If it was facing up, its maximization would be infinite. Okay, so it faces down and I want to maximize it, that's fine. So it's a concave optimization problem. What does it mean when it is concave? Maximization of concave or minimization of a convex function. It means that it has only one solution, unique solution, and you can find it easily by convex optimization pro programming. So it, is, it has one global solution. That is why perceptron has various solutions. Again, one, one of the benefits of SVM over a perceptron. Perceptron using different initializations, you could find out, end up with different solutions. SVM, Thousands of thousands of times you run it, you will get the same solution. Based perception relies on its initial random optimization. So, yeah, I think it's a good time to have a break. Uh, let's come back at uh, nine, I think. Okay. Let's come back at nine.
Have a, thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, KKT conditions that for more information are on KKT conditions and cinema optimization course, but briefly mentioning them is, is here. There are four conditions named KKT conditions, KKT short for K with comb talker. Okay, so uh, one of them is, as I said, set, uh, take derivative of Lagrangian and they should be, uh, they should vanish to zero. Uh, the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to primal variables. We have beta and beta zero here. Beta is a vector, beta zero is a scalar. And we saw that they resulted in equations 12 and 13, okay? And uh, also here, primal feasibility. What was that? This was the constraint in the primal optimization problem. Uh, for all of the endpoints, we had this, do you remember? Uh, and dual feasibility, by the way, this equation 19, we re re rearrange that to become less than or equal to, uh, less, than or less than or equal to zero inequality. And dual feasibility says that all of the dual variables of the less than or equal to inequalities in the minimization problem should be non-negative. And we have them here too, okay? Which, uh, which is already equation 15, which we have. Complementary slackness is saying this. It's saying that multiplication of the dual variable and its constraint should be zero. Okay, for i from one to n for all for all of them. So alpha i is for the ith constraint, and this is the constraint. This is less than or, than or equal to zero in the parentheses. So this multiplication should be zero. For proof, see optimization course. And now let's talk about it. These KKT conditions on SCM gives us a good analysis. And you'll see how exciting this analysis will be. When you understand this analysis, you want to come and dance, okay? Uh, because of excitement. So KKT conditions. Uh, the complementary slackness, consider this, which we talked about. Also, according to equation 19, this was the primal feasibility, okay? And according to equation 20, the dual feasibility, consider all of these, okay? So there are two cases. What are the two cases? If, so because of this, it's either greater than zero or equal to zero. Do you agree? Right? Do you agree? Because of this greater than or equal to zero, it's either greater than zero or equal to zero. Okay, now what about, so we have two cases. If it's greater than zero, let's put it here. When it's greater than zero, what does it mean? It means that minus yi, I, I'm trying to reconstruct this, minus yi, beta transpose xi plus beta zero plus c is less than zero. Do you agree? Am I right? It's less than zero. When this is less than zero and it, the multiplication should be zero, it means that alpha i is zero. This is not zero. This term is not zero. This is, this is zero. This is equal to zero. So alpha i must be zero. When this is equal, it means that this term minus yi beta transpose xi plus beta zero plus c is zero. So this term is zero. This alpha i might be zero, might not be zero. However, we know that alpha i is greater than or equal to zero. So it cannot be negative. So it's alpha i is greater than or equal to zero. These two cases happen. Now let's discuss them. So we had this. We had this, okay? Now, when, consider this case. When yi beta transpose xi plus beta zero is c, equal to c. It means that the point xi is on the margin, which is the closest distance from the decision boundary. In other words, it's support vector. Why? 
Because do you agree? What was this? This was a distance. Distance. Uh, this over some normal beta was distance, right? And, and uh, we multiply the normal beta by some uh, constant and then we rename that to be C, okay? When this is exactly equal to zero, it means that this has the smallest distance that we have, right? So it's just, this, this is, on the, assume this is a decision boundary. We have some margin distances, equal margin here. Here, they are exactly on the margin. Okay, with the smallest distance. Okay, and it means that they are support vectors. They are support vectors. In this case, we saw that their alpha i's might be zero, might not be zero. It's greater than or equal to zero. So, for support vectors, the dual variables are greater than or equal to zero. Right? Now, consider this case. If y i beta transpose x i plus beta zero is greater than c, it means that they have more distance from the decision boundary than the support. They are here. They are not on the margin. In this case, alpha i is zero. The dual variables for non-support vector uh, points are, are their alpha i's are zero. Now. Now, let's go back to our optimization problem, dual optimization problem, okay? Here, the cost function, the first term has alpha i, alpha j. The second term has alpha i. For a non-support vector uh, point, the alpha is zero. It means the cost is zero. The cost disappeared. What does it mean? Optimization problem, dual optimization problem of SVM doesn't care about non-support vectors. Only takes care of the support vectors because only alpha i, alpha j is alpha i's of the support vectors are non-zero. There might be zero, but there might be not, not zero. However, for non-support vectors, they're actually zero. So they, they ignore the optimization problem of SVM ignores non-support vectors. In other words, it only considers the support vector. Okay, interesting. Do you remember I said, initially we start with distances of all points, but at the end we'll see that only it considers the support vector. Interesting. Interesting insight. So in summary, in hard margin, this what I talked so far was hard margin SVM because it is hard. We'll see that we make it soft too. In hard margin SVM, support vector is defined as the points on the margin boundary. According to equation 20, the range of alpha i corresponding to the point xi is greater than or equal to zero, okay? Various cases happen in this range. If point xi is non-support vector uh, that is outside of margins, then alpha i is zero. If point xi is a support vector that is on the margin boundary, or in the margin, but no, sorry, here you don't have this. I apologize. That's for another algorithm. On the margin boundary, then alpha i is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. In hard margin SVM, inside the margin is empty. There is no point. Okay. So far clear? According to equation 16, as I said, this is only the cost function of dual optimization problem only has alpha i's. So, so it only considers support vectors. Now you understand why SVM works well. Why? Because it only considers support vectors. The number of support vectors is low, right? How many points are close to the closest to the decision boundary? Not many. Most of the points, most this. Most of the points are non support vector. Do you agree? Therefore, it only considers a few points. Therefore, it's a sparse. Again, recall the two things about the sparse steam machine. Betting on the sparsity principle by Hastie and Tipshirani, which says that if I have two algorithms, the sparse version usually works better. And Occam's razor, which says the simpler explanation for a phenomenon is better explanation in philosophy and logic. According to these things, SPM works well. Sparse. 
Interesting. Optimization problem 17 is solved using an optimization toolbox. So what was 17? That was the dual optimization problem, okay? Uh, it can be by, solved by any optimization toolbox by any optimization algorithm, such as interior point algorithm or some algorithms just for quadratic optimization problems, quadratic programming. So you can use either optimization algorithms just for quadratic programming because it was a quadratic programming problem, or as it is a convex optimization or concave optimization problem, you can use algorithms such as interior point algorithm. Uh, I have taught this, these algorithms in optimization course on YouTube. Therefore, we obtain an optim the optimum alpha. So we can find, and it has a unique global solution. Okay. Alpha is a vector. The optimum alpha, now, now, so far it was a training phase, right? Now test phase, test phase. So uh, we put, uh, you, we use the optimum alpha in the bet. Do you remember? This was the formula of beta that we found by taking the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to beta setting to, to zero. Then it gives us the optimum beta. So put the optimal alphas in this alpha i's are the elements of vector alpha, and you will have the optimum beta. Y i and x i are from the training data point, training data set, right? As discussed in KKT conditions for any support vector x i, which is on the smallest margin to the decision boundary, we have this. We had this for the support vectors. Okay, do you agree? Now, put the, I want to find beta zero, right? So I had alpha using this, I found beta, right? Using this, I take X one, one of the support vectors, one of the support vectors, I put it in this formula. I have beta from this equation. Do you agree? I have YI also, XI and YI, one, the data and label of one of the support vectors. I have beta, I, I have C, I, I use C optimization. Right, what a constant beta zero is often usually put they put c equal to one in the literature. So, beta zero. So, why do I do that by the way? Because I when I solved equation 17, I was solving the dual optimization problem, I didn't solve the primal optimization problem. I solved the dual optimization problem, I found the optimal dual variables. Now, I need to find the optimal primal variables, which are beta and beta zero. These were the goals, beta and beta zero. So now I put the optimal dual variables to find the, the optimal primal variables, beta and beta zero. Now test phase, now test phase is sign of this. So this, these, are, these beta and beta zero are the optimal things which we found. X can be what? Any input point. It can be training point, test point, whatever, right? Any input point. Why do I take sign? Because I want to know whether it's up uh, on the upper side of the line or below, below the line, right? Which class it is. And why sign? The sign's output is plus one, minus one. I use plus one, minus one for the training, for the labels of training data. So sign, okay, y hat is, this is for the test phase. Sign is the sign function. Hard margin SVM is over, okay? Interesting, interesting. Soft margin SVM. Okay. When the two classes are roughly, roughly linearly separable, but not exactly linearly separable, we can use soft margin SVM. So this is a progress in the history of machine learning. At the start, they thought, okay, I have binary classification. Let me find some decision boundary. They came up with perceptron. But then they said, no, I want to find the best decision boundary for the better generalization. So they came up with S hard margin SVM. Then they said, what if the two classes are not linear to separable? They might have, some, some of the points might be confused in the middle, right? Let me use soft margin uh, SVM, which penalizes this misclassification, but not in a hard way, in a soft way, okay? And Later, they improved this. They said, okay, soft margin can handle some of the nonlinearity, but not much. What if the two classes are like X or 
What do I mean by XOR? This one class, another class. It's too complete. Or what if the two classes are like this? Two circular ones inside each other. How do you separate? It's very complicated for even soft margin SVM. Then they came up with kernel SVM, which was, so it, this is a history. Okay, the progress. Okay, now soft margin. In this algorithm, we penalize the few points which are misclassified by the decision boundary. So the decision boundary is still linear, but we can tolerate some misclassification in a soft way. Okay, soft margin SVM adds n additional, n additional non-negative scalar variables. These, I think uh, they call it slack variables. Okay. And addition, so I think it's called a slack value. Okay, slack variables and changes the optimization problem 11. Do you remember the primal optimization problem of hard margin SVM? It was like this we had only this and this. That's it. Now we are adding this term. Also, we are adding this minus zeta i. We are also adding this. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about it. So I'm adding gamma, sigma, i from one to n, zeta i. Okay. And here I have minus zeta i. Also all zeta i's i from one to n could be non-negative. When zeta i is equal to zero, the optimization problem reduces to the problem of hard margin sphere. Set, set zeta i to zero, you'll see it becomes hard margin sphere. Okay. Meaning that the point xi is correctly classified by the decision boundary. Okay. If a point xi is misclassified, its zeta i is greater than zero for that point. Okay. What? Okay, yeah, we, we bring it in the opt as one of the optimization, we are adding the zeta i's as one of the optimization variables, okay? So rather than only beta and beta zero as primal optimization variables, we are adding n additional optimization variables zeta i and we find them. We, we will solve it and you will see that zeta i becomes zero for the cl correctly classified. Ones. Okay, so I'm adding an additional primal optimization variables. Uh, therefore, the less the value of zeta i, the more accurate the classification is. Okay, because the less misclassification we have. This is the reason for penalizing the summation of the zeta value. I talked about this. So this, if you see my optimization course, this is a soft penalty. Okay, also called regularization term. You can see it as a regularization term. Okay, and this gamma, gamma is greater than zero. It's a regularization parameter. Why is it greater than zero? If it is zero, we are not penalizing it at all. Why? It can't be negative because I'm minimizing it. I want to minimize this penalty term. If it's negative, I'm maximizing it. Okay, and then addition of the variables zeta i i goes from one to n has loosened loosened how hard svm gets the on the classification of the points it's a, a soft margin svm tells to hard margin svm don't take it easy don't take it hard on the points okay you don't need to be very harsh so we had this the constraints can be restated. Again, I want them to become less than or equal to zero uh, constraints because it's minimization, right? So I can restate these two to be these, right? Now I form the Lagrangian. The ideas are repeated. So, but here now, these three, these are, all of the primal variables. These are the dual variables. I have this, these new dual variables for zeta i's. Sorry, sorry, for, this, for these constraints. We have n additional constraints. 
each of which needs a new 12 variable. Okay? So these alpha i's are for these constraints. These lambda i's are for these constraints. And each of them, i goes from one to n. So we have two n constraints in total. Okay? Now, this is the Lagrangian. Okay, derivative of Lagrangian with respect to beta primal variable. Again, we need to take derivative with respect to beta, beta zero, zeta i. So beta is the same as before because the other terms which we added just by zeta i, they are constant with respect to beta. Also beta zero, it's the same as before. They are constant with respect to beta. Now let's take derivative with respect to zeta i. So this is the Lagrangian, right? This term is constant goes away with respect to zeta i. This becomes gamma. The derivative of this with respect to zeta i is one. Why? The summation goes away because of this. This is zeta one plus zeta two until zeta n. Do you agree? When I take derivative with respect to zeta i, I need for a specific i. For example, two. They take derivative with respect to zeta two. So the other terms are all constant with respect to zeta two. Only zeta two, its derivative becomes one. So summation goes away as you see, because you should see this i in derivative a specific i. Okay? So it becomes gamma. And also if you multiply these in parentheses, and you will see that what do we have? The only, the only term which is not constant for with respect to zeta i is this summation of minus summation of i plus goes from one to n alpha i zeta i. So it becomes minus alpha i again with respect to a specific i. And here we also have lambda i minus lambda i with respect to a specific i. Okay, set it to zero, you will have this. So equation 27 is new. Okay. Now, again, I just reflect before, substitute what we found in the Lagrangian. So the first term is the same as before, right? The first term. The second, the, the second term has additional minus zeta i. Do you agree? The only difference is minus zeta i in the parentheses. Let's see how it impacts. So we have this additional term. Take a look at this. So we have this additional term. The other parts are the same as before. This is new. So this is new. What am I doing like before? Exactly doing as before, okay? So only difference is this, okay? Now, Let's put what we found back in the Lagrangian. So what was that? The first term became this. I'm putting it here. The second term is this, which is added newly, right? I'm repeating it here. The third term, which is this, I just simplified that it has an additional term. So the whole thing is the third term. Let's put it this, this, and this. This is the third term. The fourth term, which is this, I'm repeating it here. Okay. Now let's simplify. These and these interestingly are the same like before. So one half of it minus one becomes minus half. This, this like before we had it, okay? Now this term, this term and this term, these three terms that I just start. Let me remove the other stars. These three terms that I just start, okay? I put them back in the next to each other. I can combine the summations, right? Okay, so this is newly added newly. Then 
Interestingly, we just found by equation 27 that this is zero. So this newly added term just became zero. This became zero goes away. This is exactly what we had in the cost uh, in the, uh, the, the so the dual opt dual functional hard margin is the same as dual function of soft margin. They are the same, okay? But only dual function. So also according to the dual feasibility, we know that alpha i's are should be non-negative. Lambda i's also should be non-negative because they were both inequality constraints, right? For all i goes from one to n. Do you agree? Okay, now, considering all of the equations together. So this was the dual function, which was the same as dual function in the hard margin, uh, SVM. These, this, we had it before, these lambda i's are newly added as a dual feasibility in the KKT. This, we also had it before. What, what was this? This is with respect to beta zero. Equation 26. Okay. Equation 30 is optimization. Okay, now compare equation 16, which was the dual optimization problem of hard margin sphere, and equation 30, which is the dual optimization problem of soft margin sphere. If you see that the difference is additional, the constraints lambda i is this in the soft margin. So the only difference is this line. So we have n additional constraints in the dual optimization problem. N of them, right? I goes from one to n. Okay, according to equation 27, the constraint can be risked. So what was equation 27? This, gamma, so when we take the, took derivative of Lagrangian with respect to zeta i, set it to zero, we came up with gamma minus alpha i minus lambda i equals zero. So constraint now, as lambda i should be non-negative, okay? This is exactly what we have, right? Dual feasibility. So according to that, can I, so what was that? Let me, let me write it because I can't memorize it. Gamma minus alpha minus lambda, zero. Gamma minus alpha minus lambda, gamma minus, so gamma minus alpha I minus lambda I equals zero, right? Okay, so lambda I is gamma minus alpha I. I rearranged that equation 27. Now, as lambda I should be less, greater than or equal to zero, therefore, gamma minus alpha i should be greater than or equal to zero. Rearrange it, it becomes alpha i is less than or equal to gamma. Interesting. We can reinstate the constraint lambda i greater than or equal to zero to become alpha i is less than or equal to gamma. So this, this constraint, the first con set of constraints here, alpha i is greater than or equal to zero. Our, Lower bounds are alpha i. This constraint, which we reinstated to be this, is an upper bound on alpha i's. One of them is saying alpha i should be greater than or equal to zero. The other one says alpha i should be less than or equal to gamma. So we found a range on, on alpha i's. So we can reinstate, we can combine those two constraints to become this. Alpha i is less than, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to gamma for all i goes from one to n. So the difference of, again, another way to see the difference of soft margin and hard margin SPM is that in soft margin SPM, you are adding some upper bounds on the dual optimization value, alpha i. We didn't have less than or equal to gamma in hard margin SPM. We just added some upper bounds. Interesting. And this upper bound is a regularization parameter of the penalty term or regularization term. 
for the uh, zeta i's, right? Comparing, okay, we saw, I told you upper bound. Now let's write this in matrix form. So again, I put alpha i, alpha i's in the, the n dimensional vector, y i's in the n dimensional vector, one is the vector of ones, s i j. Again, I, I define it as this. So I will have this. I had it before. The only difference is this. The elements of alpha vector are less than or equal to gamma. And as these are in matrix form, gamma times one is gamma, right? This is the vector of ones. Okay. And as you see, it's again, a quadratic programming problem. So we can use interior point method, optimization toolboxes or quadratic programming in order to solve this. We'll find alphas. Again, we can put alpha r to be, to, into the betas and we'll see that in order to have the test phase. We'll see that. But before that, let's again discuss this KK condition. Let's talk about it. And you'll see interesting insights. So by the way, the test phase of soft margin SVM is the same as test phase of hard margin SVM. So I'm not going to talk about it again. The test phase is the same. But the optimization was different. So KKT condition, a stationary condition. Uh, we had this, so th it means that derivative of Lagrangian with respect to primal variable it vanishes to zero. But now we have n additional primal variables zeta i's. So we have these, right? Now, which resulted in equation twenty five, twenty six, and twenty seven, primal feasibility. This is the constraints in the primal feasibility. Do you remember? Like before, but we have minus zeta i's here. Dual feasibility, alpha i, lambda i, they should be greater than or equal to zero. By the way, I think there was another primal feasibility too. I forgot to write it here. What was that? Let me take a look at it. Uh, Yeah, zeta i's should be uh, non-negative for, for all i from one to n. I forgot to write it, okay? So we have these, and by the way, equation 36, which is already uh, in equation 29, and complementary slackness, these two. So we had it as before, so alpha i times its constraint should be zero. Also, we have additional constraints in the dual optimization uh, problem. Lambda i times minus zeta i. So lambda i are the dual variables and minus zeta i are exactly this it's because we can re we restated that as minus zeta i less than or equal to zero. Do you remember? In the constraint of the primal uh, uh, problem. So, we have this, the, the, the difference is addition of equation 38 now in the soft margin SPN. Okay, now we have these, let's talk about them. Let's talk about them. According to the, guys, listen to this carefully because it's, it's analysis is very exciting. According to the primal feasibility, do you agree that we had this, this was the primal feasibility, right? Y i times beta transpose x plus beta zero is greater than or equal to c minus zeta i. Okay, if this is greater than c minus zeta i again, it, uh, then alpha i should be zero. Why? According to this equation. So let me say this, if y i times beta transpose x i plus beta zero is greater than c minus zeta i, it means that this is not zero. And as it is equal to zero, this multiplication, alpha i must become zero, okay? So it means that the point is non-support vector, okay? It's a non-support vector. And outside of the margins, outside of the margins, we had similar uh, analysis in hard margin sphere, but analysis becomes a little more complicated and interesting in this case, in soft margin, I will see. 
Setting alpha i equal to zero in the cost function of problem 30, which was a dual optimization problem, makes the cost zero. Therefore, the soft margin SPM also does not care about the non-support vector points, only considers support vector points. Therefore, it's a sparse, therefore it's good, and it, et cetera. Now, consider the case where this is exactly equal to C minus zeta i, because this was either greater so it was greater than or equal to zeta i. We talked about the greater. Now let's talk about equal to c minus zeta i. Then this, this is equal to zero. Therefore, alpha i might be zero, might be not zero. But we know according to dual feasibility, alpha i's are greater than or equal to zero. Therefore, they should be greater than or equal to zero. They can't be negative. Okay? Therefore, this means that the point is a support vector and it's alpha i might be zero, might not be zero. Usually they are not zero for support vectors, okay? And they are either, now the difference here from the hard margin is here. They are either on the margin or inside the margin. In hard margin is here, inside the margin, there was nothing. In soft margin is here, we are allowing some violation, some misclassification. We are tolerating it. We are taking it easy on the points, okay? They might be violating the margin. They might be inside the margin, okay? So now let's talk about it. Let's talk about the cases now. Inside, either, sorry. Okay, now let's talk about this. So we, we already talked about non-support vectors, which are outside the margin. Now let's talk about the support vectors, which are either on the margin or inside the margin. There are several cases. If zeta i is greater than zero, it means that we are violating the margin. We are inside the margin. That is, it passes the margin. According to equation 38, what was 38? 38 was this one of the complementary slackness ones. Lambda i, zeta i equals zero, right? We just assume that the case zeta i is greater than zero. As lambda i, zeta i is zero, when zeta i is greater than zero, lambda i must be zero. So lambda i must be zero in this case. According to equation 27, this was equation 27 that we had, okay? We can rearrange it, lambda i will be this, and lambda i, we said that should be zero. Therefore, this should be zero. Rearrange that, alpha i becomes gamma, okay? So when we are violated, we are inside the margin, that the alpha i is gamma, gamma. And gamma was the regularization parameter in the uh, prop optimization. If zeta i is zero, not violating the margin, okay? It's exactly on the margin not violating the margin. That is exactly on the margin border. According to equations 60, 36 and 38, what was 36 was this and 38. Okay, so this is 38 and 36, we know that. Uh, so zeta i is zero. Lambda i therefore can be zero, can be non-zero. However, we know lambda i should be non-negative by dual feasibility. Therefore, lambda i should be greater than or equal to zero, okay? The case lambda i equals zero is like above case, and we have exactly like here. And we have alpha i equals gamma, right? However, for the case lambda i is greater than zero, okay? Then according to equation 27, which was this, I can write lambda i as gamma minus alpha i. We say it is greater than zero. Therefore, alpha i is less than gamma, okay? As you see, I'm, it's like a tree. I'm breaking to the cases and the, also the cases to subcases, okay? So overall, in case there is gamma i equals zero, the point is on the, is on the margin border and we have alpha i is less than or equal to gamma. Less than gamma, we, pro we proved it here. Equal to gamma, we proved it here. 
okay, less than gamma or equal to gamma. So in, in overall, less than or equal to gamma for when the point is on the margin board. I have drawn, in summary, I, let me, let's talk about it in this way. See this figure? So these points, these points that I'm circling around are non-support vectors. Their alpha i's are zero, right? Now, Now let's talk about these points, which are exactly on the, uh, on the border. Which are exactly on the border. These three points, they are support vectors. They are correctly classified, okay? Their alpha i's are exactly equal to gamma. Their lambda i's are zero, okay? We talked about it. And now consider the violating points. The violating points have two subcases. They are either correctly classified or they are misclassified. Consider the point, this point, and this point, these two points which I circle. As I said, Oh, sorry about that. About the, on the margin, the alpha i is great, less than or equal to gamma and lambda i is greater than or equal to zero. But if they are inside the margin, but correctly classified, alpha is equal to gamma and lambda i is zero, okay? Now consider the case Now consider the case where they are inside the margin, but misclassified like this. So they pass the border. Alpha is, is gamma like this, lambda is also zero. So in simple words, if they are non-support vectors, their alpha i's are zero. If they are on the margin, they are support vectors, their alpha i's are less than or equal to gamma, their lambda i's are greater than or equal to zero. If they are inside the margin or violating the margin, two subcases happen. They are either correctly classified or misclassified. In both cases, in both subcases, alpha i is gamma and lambda i is zero. And in soft margin, SVM, we, ca we call all of the points in on the margins or inside the margin support vectors. So these, all of these points, are support vectors, okay? In hard margin SVM, only on the margin. Inside the margin, there is nothing. So this analysis, which I talked about, to summarize, are summarized in, this, in these bullet points, okay? So you should consider the cases where uh, there are several cases and subcases with different alpha i's conditions and alpha i, uh, lambda i's and, uh, Zeta i's and these, okay? Uh, the next thing is kernelization in machine learning. Let me briefly introduce it and then we'll go over it uh, in the next session. So kernelization, just, just I will finish it in one minute. <laughs> okay, so when I have some data points, assume, Consider these, are they linearly separate? Consider these classes, are they linearly separable? Not at all, but I can, these are in 2D. And in 3D, I can maybe increase the, uh, the dimensionality and I bring one of them above. Then they become linearly separated by a plane. Okay. So kernel SVM says that, let me do, okay, it's gone, but 
let me apply some transformation on data, to, which usually, increase, usually increases the dimensionality of data. Then hopefully, after this transformation, they become linear to separable, and then I apply linear SVM on them. So what? What happened? SVM was linear, linear classifier. I can't apply it on nonlinearly separable classes. The idea behind kernel SVM is that let's do some pre-processing, some transformation to make them hopefully linearly separable, and then I apply the linear SVM on them. This is the uh, idea behind kernel SVM, which we'll go through in the next session. Thank you. Thank you.